Shalom, I'm Rabbi Rabbi Harris, and welcome to our final video podcast entitled Mizmor Shil Yom Shabbat, Shabbat in Liturgy and Song. We're going to pick up our discussion from where we left off. We had you singing at the Friday evening uh, table at home, and then presumably you went to sleep. You wake up the next morning, Shabbat morning, and head off to synagogue. The fabled Shacharit Musaf, the long service of a Shabbat morning uh, of at least a few hours. Now, we're not going to go through all of Shabbat morning liturgy, but I do want to talk about the Torah reading, because originally, going back 2,000 years, it was the reading of scriptures, right, as we would say in English, the reading of Torah um, on Shabbat that was one of his most distinguishing characteristics, especially since the prayers of the early, um, you know, the early period of the Common Era were really much shorter than they are today. It was the Shabbat service of reading the Torah out loud that was its most distinguishing characteristic. Now, in antiquity, they did what scholars now call a triennial cycle. This has really very little to do with the triennial cycle that some synagogues follow today, where we read a third uh, each year of the regular parasha. Um, so let me explain what that's all about. In antiquity, apparently Jews read the Torah in the land of Israel uh, in its entirety once every three or three and a half years. And this itself is rooted in a reading of the, towards the end of the book of Deuteronomy. In a, it's a, a section called Hakel, get together once every seven years and read the Torah. Now, whatever that might have meant in Deuteronomy, apparently it meant get together once every seven years and read the Torah on the holiday of Sukkot. Uh, the rabbis or early sages clearly understood that, that there was a cycle of reading the Torah that needed to be completed every seven years. Perhaps it was twice through every seven years, uh, that, that is once every three and a half years, and uh, eventually that worked itself out into a, a three-year cycle of reading the Torah. Uh, it was never really worked out in, a, in, in exactness. Um, uh, Jews, Jewish communities did not necessarily start and end their Torah reading uh, in the same time of the year, nor did they all finish together. Nonetheless, uh, the, the idea was that you read a little bit of the Torah each Shabbat morning, and um, eventually, we don't really know how it started, but you would read prophetic readings too, the Haftarah, uh, meaning what do you read in Scripture after you're done with the Torah reading, and that's really what the word haftarah means. It doesn't mean half Torah. In fact, even the Torah word in haftarah is not even spelled the same way as the word Torah. The custom that we follow today of finishing the Torah once every year, or the so-called annual cycle, is really the Babylonian yeshiva custom. Uh, and instead of having a sidra or a seder, which is what they called the smaller triennial portions in the land of Israel, the Babylonian Jews in their academies called them parashiot, or a parsha. And that's the, uh, the, the reason why in today's Jewish uh, parlance, sometimes people you, uh, call a Torah reading a sidra, and some of them call it a parsha. One is really a Babylonian term, and one is really an Eretz Yisraeli term. In any case, in the Babylonian yeshivas, they finish the Torah once every year. So the parashot were longer than the sidarim. Be that as it may, by the high Middle Ages, about six, eight hundred years ago or so, um, uh, the Babylonian custom became prevalent. It's a long story, which we won't go into today. And Jews all over the world read the Torah through once every year. And we finish the reading of the Torah again around Sukkot, of course, the ninth day of Sukkot, with the holiday of Simchat Torah, uh, during which we celebrate the completion of the Torah reading and the beginning of the, uh, the new cycle. Now, in some synagogues today, uh, people feel that the parashiot are too long, and they divide them into thirds in some uh, uh, organized system or not so organized. Uh, the one that is followed in many conservative synagogues is that we read the first third of the annual cycle one year, the second third in the second year, and obviously the third third in the third year. Now this provides for a reading that is not exactly continuous one week to the next, but nonetheless is found, uh, found to be very popular in many synagogues. In any case, what I wanted uh, to share with you is that the Torah reading that we do on Shabbat morning, and indeed anytime we do an official Torah reading in the synagogue, 
This is not Talmud Torah. This is not the study of Torah, and it shouldn't be construed as that. Uh, in fact, when we study Torah privately or in a class and we want to make a liturgical moment out of it, we recite brachot. Those brachot are found in the beginning of a siddur, and they include such lines as la'asok b'divrei Torah. We praise God that God has given us the opportunity to occupy ourselves with the study of Torah. And the, the, the idea of Talmud Torah Lishma, the study of Torah for its own sake, is something that we do not necessarily in a synagogue. We're supposed to do a little bit of it uh, at least every day. So what does the Shabbat morning uh, Torah reading uh, signify if it's not the study of Torah? And in fact, what it is is a ritual reenactment of Ma'amad Har Sinai, the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. And the liturgies that we recite, both before we take the Torah out and as we put the Torah back in the ark, we're putting it into the ark, taking it out of the ark, is sort of like getting the Torah from God on Mount Sinai. And um, uh, it's a ritual moment, not really a study moment. Uh, but it is, in any case, the highlight of the Shabbat morning service. Now, some of you might say, hey, the highlight is the Kiddush and the, um, you know, the bagels and lox, but um, that's up to you. At any rate, we continue. Eventually, however long our synagogue services are, we come home and we have our Shabbat meal. At the very minimum, we have what's called Kiddush Rabbah, or Great Kiddush. And that doesn't mean, wow, it was a great Kiddush. It means really big or long Kiddush, which is ironic because this is the Kiddush that's not really, um, uh, not really important in the same way that the Friday evening Kiddush or the Saturday evening Havdalah uh, are. Um, Kiddush Rabbah is so-called because of its lesser status and the desire of those who advocate its, advocated its recitation to, to make it seem more important. Um, but you have that Shabbat Kiddush and you have a meal, and that leads you to perhaps what's, uh, what is for some people the best part of Shabbat, and that is rest. Because remember, the whole essence of Shabbat from the Bible on is to rest on the seventh day and take a break from your work week. So some people think of the word Shabbat as an acronym. The Shin, the Bet, and the Tav of the word Shabbat, each signifying its own word. Shena b'Shabbat ta'anug, meaning uh, sleep on the Sabbath is a joy, is a delight, right? And that old Shabbos shluff on Saturday afternoon is for some people the highlight of their Shabbat experience. Um, some of us get back to shul on Shabbat afternoon for the mincha service and the concluding uh, uh, evening service of uh, Motzei Shabbat or the conclusion of Shabbat. And um, it, you might remember pause here. Now, at least one of the distinguishing characteristics of Shabbat in the afternoon is its Amida. I made a reference earlier that the various recitations of the prayer Amida, or the Shemona Esrei, that we recite on Shabbat all have some different elements. The one on Shabbat afternoon begins, Ata Echad v'shimcha Echad. You are one, and your name is one. And that was actually the title of our mini session, uh, Shabbat, A Mystical Experience. Well, on the one hand, saying to God, you are one and your name is one, evokes for us such obvious references as Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Um, uh, our recitation of, of our acknowledgement that God's oneness is unique and unlike any other oneness that ever could be uh, conceptualized. That's uh, a very Maimonidean approach, but nonetheless, it's the one that most of us share. Um, or we sing at the end of Aleinu, when as soon as you hear the Venemar, what we're doing is we're, we're setting ourselves up for um, a, a recitation of a verse from the prophet Zechariah, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the 12 so-called minor prophets, and his idea that on such and such a day, God would be one and his name would be one. And that's, again, a reference to, um, to a biblical verse that we recite when we say the uh, prayer in the Amida, Ata Echad v'shim ha Echad. But there's also another word that sounds like Echad in Hebrew, and that's Miyuchad, very, very special. And another word, Yichud, a real union. And the, the Kabbalists 
make out of this word a very, very particular kind of Shabbat experience. Now, in thinking of this phrase, ata echad v'shimcha echad, um, and, and one of the derivative words, yichud, or union, I'd like to think of, I'd like us to think together of a very, very famous rabbi, Rabbi Yosef Karo, one of the great Kabbalists of Tzfat, who's probably more famous as being the author of the Shulchan Aruch, one of the most definitive codes of Jewish law. Now, some people are surprised that such a great jurist uh, as Rabbi Yosef Karo was also a mystic because they somehow think, well, there's the uh, observance of Jewish law on the one hand and the mystical feelings of, of uh, Kabbalah in the other. And that's really a mistake. Well, was that a phone ringing? Some people are surprised to think, no, it's not surprised to think, it's not surprised to think. Some people are surprised to learn. Okay. Some people are surprised to learn that such a great jurist like Rabbi Yosef Karo was also a mystic, and they think that Jewish law and its observance is sort of in one corner, and Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism is in another corner. And that's really not a, a helpful way of thinking about the relationship between the two. In fact, um, the great mystics of Tzfat were all meticulously observant uh, 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 Jews and rabbis in many cases, and um, they, uh, they believe that every ritual act performed by a Jew, in other words, a ritual act mandated by Jewish law, had the power to create a mystical union both within God's own presence as well as between the worshiper and God. So that when we do the um, observances of Shabbat and recite the prayers, they wanted us to think of those acts as being infused with great power. Now, I wouldn't want us to think that that power would actually, God forbid, control God. We're not saying that if I hold my tzitzit uh, in such a way that something is actually going to happen. I personally don't feel very comfortable with thinking about Jewish ritual acts in that way. But I do appreciate the, um, the clarity of thought, the kavanah that they wanted to bring to those acts, that those were acts of great devotion and great moment. So it's not just a simple thing. Ata echad v'shimcha echad. Okay, you're, you're one and your name is one. But what, what, what that means in the, the mystical moment at the end of Shabbat, when we recite the Mincha prayer, is that we are stating that we are one with God and God is one in God's own divine unity. So it's a moment of collaboration. It's a moment of partnership between God and humankind when we observe the Shabbat. In any case, Mincha ends. We recite a typical week, weeknight uh, service at its core uh, on, on Saturday evening. We add to that... Uh, got to, Start that whole section again. In any case, Mincha ends and we recite the Mariv, the evening service, for the end of Shabbat. At its core, that service is the same as any other um, uh, weeknight evening service. And yet, many, many passages are added to that. Some to bring a sense of blessing even though Shabbat is over, and some simply to prolong the Shabbat because we're reluctant to see it go. It builds towards the recitation of Havdalah, which uh, this prayer that is uh, parallel to the Kiddush that we recite on Friday evening, in the same way that uh, Kiddush marks the beginning of Shabbat and the end of the work week, Havdalah marks the end of Shabbat and the beginning of the work week. And we recite that both in the synagogue and at home. Uh, we recite uh, a blessing over wine. It could theoretically be any other uh, liquid other than water. Um, there's a candle and there's a special paragraph of liturgy. The one element that's added on, fr on Saturday evening, on Motzei Shabbat, that is not there on Friday evening is the bisamim, or the, the sweet-smelling spices. Now, what's that all about? The Midrash, as we'll come to see when we uh, get together for our last session in Baltimore, the Midrash comes to see all of Shabbat as a taste of the world to come. And for, for that, 
we mystically receive an extra soul, a neshama yitera, when we observe Shabbat. At Shabbat's end, since we're here in this world now, uh, that extra soul departs from us on Saturday evening. And frankly, we're a little bit sad about that, and we're also a little bit nervous about that, because we're, we're, we're willing, I guess, to give up the extra soul, but we want to make sure that we don't give up our one and only original soul um, and thereby lose our lives. So to cheer ourselves up, we uh, uh, inhale uh, sweet-smelling spices. Uh, in my house, it's cinnamon. Um, many people add cloves or other sweet-smelling uh, spices. Um, uh, and that is supposed to cheer us upon the departure of our, um, uh, our second soul, our neshama itera. However, we're also, as I said, a bit nervous about it. And what do we sing because we're nervous about this moment? We sing to, uh, about Eliyahu Hanavi. Eliyahu Hanavi. At that moment, we invoke Elijah's presence because it is Elijah's presence that we find as a protecting element. Um, we recite, uh, we invoke him and recite those words at a baby's bris. Baby boys, oh, we need to do this again. So at that somewhat scary moment when we're losing our nishama yitera, our second soul, we invoke Elijah's presence. Um, now there are other times during the year when we might feel a sense of danger um, uh, and we likewise invoke Elijah uh, to protect us. Um, uh, Rabbi Lawrence Hoffman has written about this quite eloquently. Um, we do that at a, at a bris of a baby boy, a brit milah, because we're worried, God forbid, um, that the Life's, uh, the baby's life might be in danger. We do this at Passover, towards the end of the uh, Seder, Leil uh, Pesach, uh, uh, because very often it was a moment of great danger of, of Jews uh, being attacked by, um, the, by their neighbors um, during the Passover week. So Elijah is also invoked on Saturday night to protect us, and that's um, one of the most distinguishing features of the Havdalah service. So there we have it, a complete outline of Shabbat. Shabbat in Halakha, Shabbat in Jewish mysticism, at least a taste of that, and Shabbat in liturgy. Um, there's a tradition going all the way back to the Bible, Sof Tavar Hakol Nishma. Uh, in the end of the matter, what's the sum? How do we know uh, in a pithy way what the whole thing stands for? So going back to the days of the Bible and Talmud, very, various Jewish uh, teachers have tried to sum up everything in one pithy statement. Uh, a famous one is uh, uh, the man who came to Hillel and said, teach me the Torah while I stand on one foot. And Hillel answered, um, uh, That which is hateful your, to yourself, do not do to your neighbor. The rest is commentary, go and learn. So how can we... Uh, conclude our video podcasts without trying to summarize all of what we've learned in one pithy statement. The statement that I've chosen to share with you, and um, uh, we'll take a look and try to sing that a little bit when we get together in Baltimore, is one of my favorite Shabbat Zmirot. It's the one that begins Me'erev, uh, I got the wrong verse, sorry. It's the one that begins Ma'yedidut Menuchatech. Um, uh, how dear is your rest, uh, O Shabbat? Um, you are Shabbat the Queen. Um, we run towards you. B'chein narutz alikratech. Bo'i chala. Come, O bride. You see there are elements that are picked up in other uh, liturgies, uh, such as, I think there are elements that are picked up. We'll go right back to that point. Bowie Chala, uh, come my bride. You see elements are picked up in other uh, prayers as well. And this is a, um, a several uh, stanza long um, a poem or song written, we know from the first letters, by uh, a, an author named Menachem. And in it he tries to summarize all of the joy as well as all of the restrictions of Shabbat. Um, he writes, Chafetzecha Bo Asurim, your business um, uh, uh, accoutrement. Oh God, that was terrible. Accoutrement. What am I thinking of? 
One verse begins, Chafetzecha bo asurim, your material weekday possessions are forbidden on the Shabbat. So we have elements of the thou shalt nots, as well, of course, the many thou shalts. And each uh, 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 stanza concludes with um, a description of the great menu that this uh, uh, author is imagining for Shabbat meals. Um, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, tasty fowl dishes, not just chicken. Now, this song ends with the words, Me'en Holam Haba. The observance of Shabbat done correctly is like a taste of the world to come. And if you've been wondering all along why we called this series Shabbat from Here to Eternity, it wasn't just a reference to the great movie of the early 1950s, but it's a sense that Shabbat goes from the beginning of creation through our observance of it and into a taste of the world to come. So when one of the verses begins, Me'en Olam Haba, we're stretching forth our understanding of Shabbat from the very beginning in Bereshit, in the book of Genesis, when Shabbat was first created as God's own institution of God's own rest, through our observance, here in the present day, throughout all of Jewish history, the way it's come down to us and the way it's been mandated for us by the rabbis and by the Bible, and into our very lives and our sense of selves throughout all eternity. Me'en olam haba. So observing Shabbat is a taste of the world to come. That concludes our video podcast. I know we're going to get together one more time in Baltimore, and I want to thank you for your participation in this wonderful program. Shalom u'lehitra'ot.